Good evening and welcome to Bridging Asia, the Singapore Debates, a platform to deliberate the challenges the region will face in the 21st century. I'm Brendan Fernandez and I'm your moderator. Tonight's motion is, social media can do more harm than good. Social media is technically a means for interaction through the web, and its ideological purpose is the free flow exchange of ideas. But has it done more harm than good? Our distinguished panel of speakers will deliberate on this. In our audience today, we have stakeholders, academics, thinkers and business people. Earlier, we polled them to find out where they stand on this issue. Currently, 34.8% agree with the motion and 65.2% disagree. We'll be doing another poll later on to see if the audience opinion has shifted. Let's now welcome our panelists. Let's start off with the team proposing today's motion. First, Professor Simon Chesterman, Dean of the Faculty of Law, National University of Singapore. Professor Chesterman is the author and editor of several books, including One Nation Under Surveillance. Welcome. Joining him is Mr. Vikram Nair, a Singapore Member of Parliament. Welcome, sir. And now speaking for the opposition, first Dr. Ong Kien Ming, Professor of Political Science at UCSI University in Kuala Lumpur. Welcome Dr. Ong. Dr. Ong is a keen observer of how politicians in Malaysia make use of social media. Finally, Dr. Peter Marolt from the Asia Research Institute of the National University of Singapore. Welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your panel for the motion. Social media can do more harm than good. Each panelist will now be given one minute to state their case. Based on our coin toss earlier, the opposition will be beginning. So, Dr. Ong, if you're ready, your one minute begins now. Hi, I'd like to do a quick thought experiment with you. I want you to think back on all the good things that uh, social media has given to you over the past year. Think of the time when you first heard on YouTube uh, an aspiring MP candidate utter the words, I just don't know what to say. Or when a certain Miss Singapore said, booms. Think of the times when you updated your Facebook status and waited eagerly for your friends to respond. Or when you uh, had a heartfelt blog post that you wanted people to respond to. Those would be some of the positive uh, things that you would have taken away from social media. And now think of the negative things. Yes, there may have been times when you had to uh, change your dating status from uh, dating to uh, it's complicated and perhaps to you know, you're single. But I would uh, argue that most of the time, social media has brought more positive uh, than negative uh, benefits to you. And the reason for this is because you're empowered to make choices for your own through social media. Thank you, Dr. Ong. Now let's hear from the proposition. Professor Chesterman, if you're ready, your one minute begins now. Thank you very much, Brandon. Uh, there's no doubt that the internet and social media have given people choices, have broken down barriers, given people access to information at a scale we've never known in human history. It's also true that we're now in a position to share our views with more people around the world than ever before. In theory, that should, access us, that should enable us to increase the pool of human knowledge and raise the level of discourse. In reality, however, what we've got is a vast amount of noise, lots of videos of kittens, and what we've got is increasingly an echo chamber politically. So breadth of information, breadth of access to spreading our views has come at the expense of, death, of depth. And so what we'll be arguing is that both in theory, in terms of the way in which we use information, have access in, to information, the way in which we think, and in practice, in terms of the way in which this has impacted on political processes, social media has demonstrated that it can indeed do more harm than good. Thank you, Professor Chesterman. Back to the opposition now. So, Dr. Marolt, your one minute begins now. Thank you. Um, I have been studying that noise that Simon had just mentioned um, in China for the last couple of years. And I have found the more I look at it, the less it is actually noise. What it is, is it comes down to a question of believing is seeing. If we believe 
that social media is harmful, then we tend to focus on those incidents and issues where this is actually the case. If we believe that social media is more than that, and that's something I will elaborate on later, then we, we, can, we have the chance to, um, to see the full capacity of social media. Thank you, Dr. Morolt. Finally, Mr. Vikram Nair, your one minute begins now. Um, I think social media can do a lot of good, but the real question here is whether or not social media can do more harm than good. And this requires a little bit of an imaginative exercise as well, because we're not just talking about what social media does in the here and now. It also requires us to look into the future and decide whether or not it can do more harm than good. And I think the importance of this motion is really if you, want, if you have something very good, you must know what harm it can do so that you can deal with it appropriately and manage that harm. And there are two main points that I would like to make. One, I think if you look at current um, developments and the use of social media in practice, you can see elements of how this harm can play out in future. And a large part of that is also because of the power of social media. The second aspect can do more harm than good is even for the individuals who wish to use it. And I'll highlight you know, some examples where even though you might think it's a good thing, if you're not careful, it can do more harm than good. And that's really what this debate is about. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nair. We now live in a new borderless world. Today, social media helps create a communication network unimaginable even just a few years ago. So is the virtual world really a better place to live in? Throughout the course of this debate, you, the studio audience, can post questions to our panelists. We'll be taking some of those questions later during question time. A poll is also ongoing. You can vote on which side presents the more convincing argument. We'll be tracking the poll throughout the course of this show. Up next is your stand. Each panelist is given three minutes to argue and expand on their points. The opposition began earlier, so now let's hear from the proposition. First up, Professor Simon Chesterman. Your three minutes begins now. Thank you, Brendan. So, social media can do more harm than good. We'll be approaching this from the proposition side in terms of theory and practice. And I'm going to make three fairly obvious, I think, points. The first is to highlight what the increase in access to and use of social media has done for the quality of information that we have available to us. Second, what it's done to our notion of public and private spaces. And then thirdly, what it's done to the nature of political discourse. And that will lead into Vikram's examination of what all this means in practice. So quality of information. One of the great things about the internet and social media more generally is that it's user-driven, that it's decentralized, that it can be anonymous. User-driven meant that it means that it's sometimes more democratic, it seems. Decentralized means that it's not constrained by economic viability. Anyone can publish on the internet. Anyone can be famous on the internet. Anonymous, it can be sometimes liberating, as Peter's highlighted in a place like China in particular. The anonymity of the internet can be liberating. But these three advantages are also the disadvantages. Being user-driven means that the internet generally and social media in particular attracts extreme views. Being decentralized means that there's no quality control. And so, again, we have this breadth of information at the, expense, ex at the expense of any depth of analysis. And being anonymous or having the ability to have an artificial identi identity means that very often there's no accountability for what one is saying. So what has this done in terms of the way in which we use information? There are various studies showing how many young people today demonstrate more traits of narcissism, of lack of concentration, because they're constantly checking their Facebook status updates. And indeed, within the law school, one thing I'm finding is that increasingly law students are thinking twice about whether Facebook is a really uh, a useful way of spending their time. What's this done to our notions of public and private? Well, um, one of the things I've been examining is the way in which our treatment of uh, privacy uh, changes depending on how we act in public. So in theory, everyone's very defensive of their privacy rights, but in practice, they tend to operate in a manner that's completely inconsistent with that. So while people will uh, kick and scream whenever Facebook changes its privacy settings, once that debate dies down, they will get back to posting embarrassing photos about themselves and their deepest innermost thoughts available to people around the world. And this isn't just limited to university students. The current head of MI6 
uh, his wife uh, two years ago was revealed to have had a Facebook, uh, uh, Facebook page which revealed all sorts of private information, even about the head of Britain's most secret uh, intelligence service. So what does this do for the level of political discourse, lastly? Well, the consequence is most obvious in the political realm, that we have a lot of noise, meaning that there's a lot of disinformation out there. We often have echo chambers, so people tend not to broaden their views, but to reinforce their views only by interacting with people with whom they agree. And you have a lot of irresponsible commentary. What should we do about this? You can't shut it Professor down. Justin, you can't I do put have the to stop you back there the as your time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next from the opposition, Dr. Ong Kian Ming. If you're ready, your three minutes begins right now. I also have three points to make in regards to uh, how social media has actually brought much more good uh, than harm. And I think all of them relate to the issue of empowerment. Empowerment, empowerment for empowerment's sake itself is not uh, something that I want to uh, drive on. But the fact that empowerment is something that brings about uh, better quality of uh, discussion and better outcomes that is especially important in countries that are less than fully democratic. Uh, and it would lead to uh, three very important points, which is information which empowers, uh, accountability uh, which empowers, and also the presence of network effects which empowers. The first point, information which empowers. I think uh, the fact that we have, when we have social media, we have a much uh, you know, greater choice in terms of choosing the kind of information that uh, Simon has talked about. Uh, the breadth of information that comes about with social media also allows us to choose uh, the depth of information in terms of uh, uh, good quality reporting that comes out uh, and, and, and shield away some of the bad quality reporting that comes out. Uh, information also, uh, another important point, drives uh, competition in the sphere of information provision. For example, I want to point to the recent coverage of the Singapore general elections where I think uh, the mainstream press was forced to compete against uh, online uh, alternatives, including in the social media, that brought about uh, an increased elevation in the quality of the informa information that was coming out. The second point, accountability. I think this is a very important point uh, on the part of uh, politicians in the social political sphere, whereby without social media, they may not have to take uh, full account into, in terms of what they say in public as well as in private. So, for example, if uh, uh, the daughter of an MP writes uh, to you know, another blogger about wanting this person to get out of her uncaring elite face, that person would have to be held account for her, uh, held account for her comments. If, let's say, a senior minister of state comes out to, to express concern that uh, the, there may be a drastic uh, change in her standard of living because of pay cuts of, min of, of uh, ministers, that person would also have to be uh, taken, uh, would have to account uh, for his or her statements. So I, I think from the accountability perspective, politicians cannot say one thing to one uh, crowd and another to another crowd because social media captures so much of this information online and can spread it out relatively quickly or very quickly. The last point I want to make about empowerment is that the network effects is actually very important because previously you may have thought that you were the only one who thought about this. And this would not uh, include not just uh, extremist views, but views that are perhaps uh, more on the moderate side as well. And I think social media actually allows you to choose to interact with people who are not just similar to you, but also different from you, so that you can uh, engage in a more high-quality debate and discussion, so that you can win over the people who are in the middle of the road. Thank you, Dr. Ong. Your time is up. Thank you very much. We've heard from the first speaker from both the proposition and the opposition. Let's take a look at the poll as it stands right now. It is neck and neck, 50-50 for the proposition and the opposition. So there has been some movement in favor of the proposition. After the break, we'll continue with your stand. Stay with us. You're watching Bridging Asia, the Singapore Debates. The motion tonight, social media can do more harm than good. Before the break, the first speaker from the proposition and the opposition made their arguments. Now the next speaker from the proposition will have three minutes to state his case. So, Mr. Vikram Nair, your three minutes begins now. Um, I actually agree that the social media is a tool that empowers. So, and the fact that it empowers a lot of people, I think, is a good thing. 
But I also think that that is the seed of where we find the harm of social media. For example, when social media um, helped in the Arab Spring, for example, people said it was a wonderful tool. It you know, allowed the rebels to fight against autocratic governments. But ironically, when the London riots broke out, it was again social media that empowered the rioters to tell each other exactly where to go, which shops to burn down, where to attack. And the network effect that, you know, I guess, helped the Arab Springs also helped people who were essentially you know, breaking law and order and undermining legitimacy of democratically elected governments as well. And that, I think, is probably the first harm of social media. And let's take it further, because one of the other points that was made was that social media is a good way for you to find like-minded people. But unfortunately, and perhaps even scarily enough, extremist groups have also found that to be useful. And I mean, in Singapore, not too long ago, we had a case of a self-radicalized terrorist who was you know, on the way to Afghanistan to fight a war. Now, with social media, that could go even further. So it is not just something that empowers the good and the kind-hearted and the people who want to fight for freedom. It is also a tool that can empower people who want to do harm. And it's precisely because it is so powerful that it can actually do a lot of harm. And that's what we have to be careful about. So while we may embrace a lot of its benefits, we have to be very aware of the serious harm it can do. Now, the second point about social media is how it actually relates to the individuals. Now, I know many individuals might have found it empowering a way to you know, make friends and so on. But what is interesting is that if you were to use the social media as a means of making friends, you could also open yourself up to predators, people who might abuse that trust. And recently we had a bust of a pornographic ring that was you know, essentially circulating and perpetuating itself using online media. So again, it is not just good people who make friends, but it's also bad people who can you know, trick, abuse trust and so on. And let's go further. I mean, you know, I think politicians as a group don't get a lot of sympathy and we probably don't deserve a lot of sympathy. So the fact that you know, social media brings greater scrutiny to us is a good thing. But even from the point of view of politicians who might want to say use social media as a means of communicating that tool, I think even for them, they have to be careful because if they're not careful, it can definitely do more harm than good. Um, I think a lot of the examples that have been brought up show how you know, politicians who've used the social media incorrectly have suffered a lot of harm. Um, I, and I think another um, an example that was mentioned a little bit earlier was that of Mr. Sashi Tharoor, who was, uh, I think, um, whose political career took a serious knock because of a uh, tweet that went wrong. So the reality is, not just politicians, but their entire families can be subject to an incredible amount of scrutiny. So ultimately, I think social media can do more Ms. harm Nair, than good have to stop for you individuals too. Your time is up. Okay, thank, thank you very you. much. <laughs> wow. And now over to the opposition, Dr. Peter Marolt. Your three minutes begins now. Yes. Um, there has been a lot of important points made. I think, let me start with the Arab Spring. Vikram had mentioned it. And um, globally, I think the Arab Spring, there is the Occupy movement that started in the US, moved over to Europe. Um, in China, there are more and more mass incidents. That those things can be seen as signs that people are quite unhappy with the political process on a global scale. Um, at the same time, social media plays an important role in this, and it's probably, for me as a researcher, too early to really assess what that role is, whether it's really harmful or, you know, um, but I'm trying to focus on the positive parts because looking at China, we have seen huge changes over the last decade, basically. Um, now 500 million people in China use the Internet. Uh, the numbers on how many of those are actively engaging in social media um, are not really that reliable, but there is a lot of people engaging in social media. Um, they are exposed to information that they did not have before. The party line on the internet, you do not only get the party line, you get a lot of information, maybe too much. Um, you see lots of viewpoints. What does it do to you when you are exposed to this kind of information, this kind of information overload? You get to think, maybe. Some of them, you know, some people will start to think and maybe develop ideas, develop thoughts, develop 
um, the authority necessary to challenge the status quo. And social media is playing, in my opinion, an important role in that. The other point I want to make really quick is who is it to decide which part of social media is negative and which is positive? There are definitely harmful parts, but what do we do about it? Do we shut down social media? Do we curtail certain, certain aspects? And if so, who is going to decide for us, the citizens, which, you know, which aspects are harmful and which are not? Because from my perspective, looking at China, aspects that might seem harmful, you know, later may turn out positive. But that's maybe just because I have a rather optimistic view of, you know, the future. What other choice do I have? Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Marolt. Now, the panelists have raised some very pertinent issues, but I am sure there are many questions from our studio audience as well. Before that, let's have a look at the polls and where they stand right now. Now, if you remember, most of the audience were not in favor of the motion. That has changed. And now, most of the audience, 55.6%, in fact, now agree with the motion in favor of the proposition. We'd now like to ask for questions from the floor. Yes, sir. My name is Leon Pereira. I'd like to ask a question to the proposition. How else would news that is perhaps inconvenient or embarrassing to national governments, but still important for the public to, to know of, you know, what alternative means uh, could there be for that kind of information to come to public attention if there wasn't a relatively free social media sphere? I think um, the degree of media control, for example, is an issue that is open to, uh, I guess, a lot of debate and the question whether governments control it or private corporations control it. I think the reality is all media of some form probably has some kind of bias and probably every journalist has a bias too. So I think media is one way in which information can be propagated en masse. Now, I'm not saying that social media is a bad thing. I think social media is, you know, it's probably good um, and, you know, I think in the hands of ordinary people it can probably be used for them to express views and so on. The only reason we are emphasizing why it's important to recognize it can do more harm than good is I think it is necessary to probably put some boundaries on that. I don't think political censorship of um, social media, for example, is ever defensible. Um, but on the other hand, you know, there are other grounds on which you might want to regulate it. And I think you know, we've discussed some examples where I think you know, neither side has really contested the harm. So I think those are areas where you recognize it can do more harm than good, and then you step in to regulate it. So I'm not saying we should do away with it. I think it is useful. It has its benefits. But recognize the harm it can do and regulate accordingly. I'd like to jump in, actually, and throw it over to Mr. Onkin, Dr. Onkin Ming. Can I also yes. add a little bit to that? Because I think that's the crux of the matter here, uh, especially in terms of uh, social media, the importance of social media in less than democratic uh, settings. Because uh, many of the arguments that uh, Simon brought up, for example, the fact that there's no quality control, there's no accountability, you know, some extreme views may, 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 be, may dominate, they probably apply more in the context of, of a democratic country where these kinds of freedoms are already freely available uh, in, in, in the mainstream press. But in less than democratic countries, uh, you know, the alternative views, for example, don't even get a hearing in, in, in the mainstream media. Hence, social media is actually a very, very important tool, which is why I think uh, censors censorship of any, any uh, sort will actually do more harm than good uh, in terms of uh, trying to regulate so social media. We have a comment from Professor Chesterman. Right, so I, mean, I think Leon's asked a very important question, but we're all focusing on the supply side. And to me, the answer is not to shut down the supply, it's to look at the demand. You can't close down social media. Even in China, intelligent people have workarounds to run Facebook accounts. They can view YouTube if they really want to. There are, there are ways of getting around it. To me, in, across societies, the problem really is how to teach people to do their own quality control. We no longer have an, a regime where there are quality newspapers of record alone and that's your source of information. We have this proliferation of a vast array of information and what that really does is it puts the onus on the individual consumer to put these things in context, to work out what's valuable, what's credible, what's believable, and what is dangerous. And at the moment, I think we're in this transitional stage where we've got this massive supply, but we don't know how to, do, we don't know how to deal with the information. And that's causing real problems, especially for young people. And this is a problem we confront routinely at university, where people need to develop more critical capacity so they can work out what's valuable and what's garbage. Thank you. I'd like to ask Dr. Marold for a quick comment. Let me just say that 
we should maybe make sure that it doesn't go, this kind of control doesn't go in the same direction as with, say, mainstream media. Because um, corporations um, are very increasingly powerful in running what, you know, the average citizen who is not in social media gets to see and gets to read. If we do the same thing to social media, social media is, you know, useless. Thank you very much. We're going for a quick commercial break, but before that, let's take a look at how the poll stands. Currently, 47.8% agree with the motion in favor of the proposition and 52.2% disagree in favor of the opposition. So it is a very, very close fight right now. Bridging Asia, the Singapore debates will continue in just a while. Welcome back to Bridging Asia, the Singapore Debates. The motion being debated tonight is social media can do more harm than good. This is question time where our audience is posing questions to our panelists. I've heard that we have a question from the floor. A gentleman in the front row. Tell us who you are, where you're from, and uh, be concise as possible, and direct your question to who you'd like to direct it to. Thank you. I'm Sean, and I'm representing Hua Chong Institution. The question I have is regarding uh, is direct to, directed to proposition. Can proposition give reasons for why they believe that the propensity for abuse of the social media is much more likely than the benefits that were raised by opposition? Yes, the argument is often guns don't kill people, people with guns kill people, and different countries will take different views. The United States, because of its Second Amendment to the Constitution, has a very different view about regulation of weapons from a place like Singapore, where the attitude is that the harm associated with having such weapons available is too great to risk. What we're essentially arguing is that, yes, social media is a tool, and so tools depend on how they're used and how they're received, and that uh, the argument today is whether the tool of social media runs the risk of being more harmful than beneficial, and unless, unless you have an educated population who knows how to put the information that is disseminated through social media in context, I think it's fairly clear that social media can do more harm than good. Thank you very much. We have a question from the online system, and this one is directed to Mr. Nair. Mr. Nair speaks about pornographic images uh, and so on. Those types of groups were in existence before social media. Do you really believe that this is the fault of social media? I think ultimately social media is a tool that empowers. And I think we've seen a lot of how it empowers ordinary people, and I think that is generally a good thing. But I think, I mean, the bigger mischief that I have in mind is that it also empowers people who may want to do evil. So, you know, just like a gun, I mean, you know, previously if two people had a fight, they used their fists, not much harm happens. But if both of them have guns, then you might end up with dead bodies. And I think not only is, I think, social media dangerous if, you know, uh, people don't, aren't able to evaluate information. I think an additional danger is if the wrong people use it to propagate causes that you know, may do more harm than good. Uh, and you know, I've highlighted some examples which I think are uncontroversial. I mean, you know, terrorists may use it and abuse it. Um, pornographic rings, child pornography. I mean, these are all areas where you know, they existed before, but because of this tool, they can, they can extend their presence. And going forward, I mean, you know, more people, more people with mischief in mind might use the social media to do more harm than good. And that's what we have to be aware of. Thank you. We have more questions from the floor. I believe, yes, that gentleman at the end of the second row. How would the opposition feel, if you're talking about transparency of information, if a young man who had bipolar disorder had all his medical records put on the internet and this person is trying his best to get back into life, uh, have a good job and to support his family. Is that the kind of openness and transparency that we want social media to have access to? Actually, I think some of the arguments uh, that have been made by the, by the gentleman and the proposition share a certain similarity in that I think it's somewhat elitist in nature. Uh, for example, Simon has talked about Oh, we need to educate the, educate the masses so that they can actually know how to uh, you know, filter information and, and whatnot. I, I think that comes from a very elitist angle which uh, does not allow the public to find ways in which they can filter on their own uh, good sources of good and bad information. Uh, and similarly, in terms of London riots, I think that is an example of how you pick one uh, very extreme uh, example, which I think has not been proven uh, definitively. Peter can talk more about this, of how... Uh, you know, social media has been used to, to propagate. Uh, you know, you have examples of many other riots that have happened with or w without the, 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 the presence of social media. And I think what we have seen, by and large, is 
uh, a large number of people enjoy social media in different ways and only a small number of them abusing them. And I think that's why there's more good than harm that has been done. Thank Brent, you. Brent, I, have, I have to respond if I can. I, I think it's outrageous <laughs> to suggest that someone advocating universal education is being elitist. What I'm advocating is that in addition to acknowledging the important point that it is the wealthy elite who tend to have access to, this, to, this, to these tools and frequently it's privileging information in English, so there's a lot of misunderstanding of what's happening in Iran and Syria, for example, based on tweets in English, which doesn't reflect the majority of the population. But the fundamental point we're making is not the elitist one that everyone, only people who are educated need, should have access to this, is that increasingly there is a democratizing impact that there is a spreading of information, but that needs to be accompanied by giving people the opportunity to make the most of it. Okay, I think on the London riots point, I mean, I have the speech of, I think, David Cameron, the Prime Minister right here, you know, essentially putting forward in Parliament the exact examples of how social media was used by rioters to, you know, organize riots and so on. I, I agree, riots have existed all the time. The point is social media gives them the power to organize it more easily. So London's in riot, there were similar uh, riots breaking out in Birmingham, Tottenham, and other areas as well that were, you know, I guess not necessarily that nearby. So social media, again, is a tool that empowers, but it empowers for evil as well. And I think the point about you know, a person's personal medical records going online is also extremely accurate because everyone is empowered, including people who want to do harm and embarrass you know, completely innocent people. Uh, yeah. On that note, we have an online question relating to democracy and social media, uh, relation to the Arab Spring. Is it just much ado about nothing? Surely people would have overthrown dictators anyway, even without social media. And this is directed at the opposition. I think whether you call it elitist or not, let's let that stand. But let me link the three questions up to the discussion that I think is going on in Singapore about creativity. Can creativity come, can be imposed from above? Certain kinds, maybe, but it's difficult. Real creativity grows in groups from the bottom up through discussions that are going on in social media. This kind of creativity, if we allow for it to happen and, you know, not, not block it in any way, it could present the solutions to those questions. You see, it could present the question, uh, the, the solution to the question, who is going to regulate the regulators? Which kind of new forms of, 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 author, of, the, sorry, of authorities do we need to, you know, make our world a better place, things like that. Dr. Ong, I'd like to ask you, what do you think about this idea? Would dictators have been overthrown with or without social media? Uh, I think we have had a good history of uh, dictators being overthrown without social media. Mm -hmm. and I, think, I think this is one of the examples of how it can empower in a good way, uh, in opposition to what uh, Vikram has said, of how people can organize uh, to coordinate their efforts uh, uh, you know, many times, uh, often in peaceful ways, to show that they are not happy with the incumbent regime. Uh, and that may, in certain, certain circumstances, expedite the process of not, over, not just overthrowing a dictator, but perhaps uh, through uh, winning uh, elections uh, and using social media to win elections through a legitimate way. I think we need to look at both of those things uh, in, together. I think the other point, of course, remember, is we're looking at things going forward. So obviously, in the Middle East, for example, we had a situation where the dictators did not control social media so much. And so in that sense, it helped the people to organize. But I think another scenario that you yourselves have brought up is what happens if the dictators themselves start controlling social media. In that case, I think it'll definitely do more harm than good because it empowers, but it also empowers the dictator if they take control of it. But it's not social media that does harm. It no, is the dictators the that yes. do yeah. the harm. Powers, yeah. 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 An important difference. Yeah. Thank you. We have another question from the floor. Uh, someone in the front row, I believe, has a question. Yes, sir? Uh, good afternoon. My name is Praful, and I represent SPDN Center of Management. My question is for both the parties. Whatever we talked till now uh, about social media is all qualitative. So is there a way we can devise a matrix or something which will capture the quantitative aspects of social media, be it good or bad, and whose onus will it be to track it? Will it be government's owners or the owners of the website uh, owners? Thank you. Well, I, I'm a lawyer, so I guess I'm not very good at numbers. I can't <laughs> think of a metric you would use to measure social media, but I'll tell you how lawyers think about it. I mean, you know, lawyers are generally people who look for things that can go wrong, and then once we identify it, we try and deal with it. So I think what we try and do is, you know, think of 
the things that can go wrong, in this case, the harm of social media, and then we come up with laws and regulations to manage that. And you know, that would by and large have to go to the democratic process. If it's outsourced to a regulator, then that regulator is ultimately you know, answerable to us. So that's the way I would look at it. Let, let me give you, it's not, not quite the exact measure that maybe you're looking for, but an example is that at some point in 2010, Facebook became the most visited page on the internet, overtaking Google. Uh, and so that was regarded by some commentators that, as the point at which people started sharing information more than searching for it. And I actually think that's a problem. I think it's a problem if people's approach to information is that they think they know everything already and they just want to spread it out to the world. Um, another metric is that uh, increasingly the value associated with the amount of information that is stored on social media, that is collected about the population, the reason, and maybe this is the best number, the reason why Facebook is valued at the tens of billions of dollars that it is, is because of the information it has been surreptitiously collecting on people using social media without their knowledge that is enormously valuable to companies uh, which then intend to use it, not necessarily for the purposes for which it was shared in the first place. Thank you. Let me ask if there is time, or we have time for one final question from the floor. Is there a final question from the members of the audience? Yes. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Jan Taro and I'm a student at uh, ESSEC Business School. So my question, as you mentioned, uh, the data collected uh, from the social media has, are extremely valuable for companies, uh, for advertisement. And so uh, do you think government has a role uh, to play in this field? So, Mr. Nye, you're a member of parliament in Singapore. Uh, I'm very interested to hear yeah. what your take on this is. Um, well, I mean, I certainly... I'm concerned, of course, you know, because obviously corporations aren't elected. They will probably be driven by profits, and they have all the power here in an unregulated environment, right? So I think it is necessary for governments to do something, but at the same time, I think governments should not step in there if it's, you know, say, to regulate political content or content that might be damaging to it. So I think the sort of things the government might do, for example, is rules to, you know, protect privacy and so on. And I think Singapore, you know, has a data protection act that might be coming up soon. So I guess things like that are things you can do to essentially protect the consumers uh, from the corporations. But yes, I mean, that is, in my view, one of the harms of social media, putting a lot of power in corporations' hands. And I think governments have a role to play to keep that in check. I just want to make one point, which is uh, the power is also in the hands of the consumer. If, let's say, uh, enough people find out that Facebook has been misappropriating, uh, mis misusing the data that they've collected, you know, the, the nature of the internet is such that, you know, yes, there are network effects that, that Facebook is an incumbent, but we've seen Google come up, replace uh, you know, so, uh, something else. We've seen Facebook come up, replace something else. And something, uh, uh, you know, another social networking site could come up to replace Facebook if, let's say, they give certain guarantees that the information would not be misused. And that's uh, a good way to see how the consumer actually can judge for themselves instead of having the government judge for them. But this, this throughout the 20th century and into the 21st, this has been a recurrent argument. It's always been proven wrong. But in theory, people claim to be concerned about their privacy, but then they go back to acting the same way uh, regardless. And that's why I think, to go to your question, as Vikram said, government absolutely has a role, but it's not to shut down social media. It's to guard against the harms that social media can cause. And in particular, the way d the data protection law will do this is by restricting what corporations can do with information beyond what an individual has consented to. And that way you can limit the harm that is done. Thank you. Our panelists have taken several questions from our studio audience. Have they managed to shift the sentiment on the ground? Let's have a look at how the poll stands right now. So... 51.9% agree with the motion and 48.1% disagree. So there has been some slight shift in favor of the proposition. It is still very, very close. Our panelists will have their final word to try and tip the scale in just a while. Stay tuned to Bridging Asia, the Singapore debates. Welcome back to Bridging Asia, the Singapore Debates. Tonight's motion is, social media can do more harm than good. We're now entering the end game after a fascinating battle of minds. It's now time for the final word. I would now request each speaker to sum up his final thoughts in one minute. We'll begin with the opposition. So, Dr. Ong Ken Meng, your one minute starts now. 
my final appeal is to ask you to see what you can do uh, as a citizen of Asia uh, on how you can use social media for good uh, and to continue the efforts of uh, what many people have done in not just uh, you know, using social media for uh, outreach to your friends, uh, getting to know, know them better, but more importantly for holding uh, our politicians uh, to account, to hold uh, corporations into account and to empower yourself so that more information can be uh, spread to different people, to be filtered uh, by uh, people whom you trust and also to uh, use the networks that you have so, so that these uh, effects can be maximised uh, to the uh, good of society as a whole uh, and to maximise the, the positive effects of social media uh, and minimise the negative effects uh, that we've talked about. Thank you. Thank you, Dr Ong. Over now to the proposition. So, Professor Simon Chesterman, your one minute begins now. Thank you, Brendan. So, we've had a fairly wide-ranging discussion about the ways in which, as we would argue it, social media can do more harm than good. I focused on the change in the way in which we produce and consume information puts much more onus on the consumer. Vikram talked about the way in which there are practical consequences that flow from this and the danger of social media as a tool uh, potentially being used for more harm than good. But let me conclude with just a, a more personalised example of how uh, there can be dangerous consequences associated with innocent activities. But if you put up a Facebook post, for example, about not wanting to have kids, ten years ago, what happens if that is used in a custody battle to try and deny you custody of children? Or what happens if insurance companies have access to the information that you've been searching about antidepressants on the internet? These are just little examples, even in our personal lives, in addition to the much grander issues we've been discussing, that show that social media can do more harm than good. Thank you, Professor Chesterman. Over now to the opposition, Dr. Peter Morolt. Your one minute begins now. Let me get back to the issue of believing is seeing. If we believe that social media is harmful, then we tend to see those parts that are harmful. If we believe it is good, then it is good. I believe it's good because what I've seen in China is it allows people, it empowers people to not only get access to a lot of information and a lot of different opinions, no. Once you digest this, once you put yourself out there and you know write your own blog or your own micro blog, uh, then you are aware that you're sharing your own opinion to the world. This makes a lot of difference. It, as many writers would say, it helps you grow. It helps you develop your point of view. It helps you um, become a better person. It helps you change the world. Thank you, Dr. Marold. Finally, Mr. Vikram Nair, your one minute begins now. Um, as I started, so I end. And I think there's no um, doubt in this debate that social media empowers. And the fact that it empowers a lot of people, I think, is a good thing. But I think in dealing with the harm it can do, it doesn't take a lot of people to misuse it. All it takes is a small number. I mean, even if only, you know, say 10% of people misuse the gun, that can cause a lot of harm. And it's the same thing with social media. I mean, there are evils out there, and I think it is important to recognize these evils, recognize these harms, so that we can deal with it and regulate it, so that hopefully the rest of us can enjoy it in a way that we currently do. Um, and I think the importance of this debate is really a debate on Asia's future, how we see social media. I think social media is welcome. I think it's a good thing. But there are a lot of harms it can do in the wrong hands. And let me finally deal with the point of governments, because this is something that keeps coming up. I think it's useful for social media to check governments. But I also think that social media, if controlled by the wrong government, can do a lot of harm. And I think we're already seeing elements of that. So I actually think it's important to regulate social media so that it's never controlled by anyone. So I have to stop harm. you there. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Your time is up. You've heard from all our panelists. They've had their say. Now you have yours. Studio audience, please cast your votes now. Choose if you agree with the motion or disagree. Here's where the poll stands right now. 54.8% agree and 45.2% disagree.
The votes are in and the audience has decided. Now, at the start of this debate, 34.8% of the studio audience had polled for the motion, 65.2% against. Let's have a look at the final tally. Have our panelists been able to sway the studio audience? The final tally stands at 47.7% in favour, 523 against. And so this goes to the opposition. Congratulations, Dr. Ong Ken Ming and Dr. Peter Marolt. You have convinced the audience that social media cannot do more harm than good. Well done, gentlemen. Professor Simon Chesterman and Mr. Naya, thank you for taking part in Bridging Asia, the Singapore debates. You've also put up a very good fight. It was a very close round. Thank you, gentlemen. Well done. It has been a riveting debate, and our panelists have given us a lot to think about. Social media has not only attracted revolutionaries in the Arab world to stay one step ahead. It has also helped earthquake survivors in times of great distress and it has helped forge relationships among communities of friends. Let me thank all our distinguished panelists and also our studio audience and all our viewers for taking part in this debate. Find out more information on the debates and make your stand on today's motion by visiting our website, channelnewsasia.com slash bridgingasia. Thank you and good night.